So after Rome won the First Punic War, the Second Punic War began some years later in 218 BC uh, when the Carthaginian general, the great Hannibal Barca, uh, who is today considered not just one of the greatest generals in all of ancient history, but perhaps one of the greatest generals in all of history, decided to provoke a war with Rome. Now, why do you provoke a war with Rome? Well, you see, Hannibal was the son of another famous Carthaginian politician and general by the name of Hamilcar Barca. Hamilcar had been in command of Carthage's armies at the end of the First Punic War, and needless to say, he was none too pleased with the way that it ended. And so Hamilcar raised his son Hannibal and all of his other sons to hate Rome, and he taught them to one day seek revenge against Carthage's great enemy. And thus it was in 218 B.C., when a young Hannibal, just in his early 20s, uh, newly promoted to general of the Carthaginian armies in Spain, decided to provoke the start of the Second Punic War in order to get that revenge against Rome. And Hannibal provoked this war by attacking a Roman allied city in present-day Spain called Saguntum. Hannibal laid siege to the city of Saguntum. And the Romans demanded that he lift the siege. They sent representatives to Carthage demanding that they order Hannibal to lift the siege. But no action was taken, and Hannibal burned the city to the ground. Rome now has no choice but declare war on Carthage, and declare war they do. With war declared, Hannibal led his army now of 40,000 troops and 40 war elephants across southern Gaul, uh, that is what is today modern France, and over the Alps into Italy. That feat by itself uh, is an amazing work of military prowess and strategy, being able to lead 40,000 guys and 40 elephants across the unforgiving Alpine mountains and into Italy. That by itself is an amazing feat. He is taking the fight directly to the Romans, but the amazing feats, the amazing uh, successes of Hannibal Barca are just beginning. And when Hannibal finally reaches Italy, uh, he is vastly outnumbered by the Romans and fighting on enemy turf. The Romans are fighting on their own home turf, so you would think Hannibal is at a grave disadvantage. But despite all of that, Hannibal shows his tactical brilliance by using fantastic uh, strategy, using trickery, misdirection, wonderful military tactics to completely outwit, outmaneuver, and defeat every Roman army that is sent against him. In the first three years of the war, Hannibal defeated the Romans on multiple occasions, but his three most crushing victories uh, came first at the Battle of Trebia. That was the first major engagement between the Romans and, uh, and Hannibal. And in this battle, the Romans send over 40,000 soldiers against Hannibal, hoping to take him out uh, before the war can really become a major war. Unfortunately for the Romans, they're again completely outwitted by Hannibal, and at the end of the day, Hannibal has destroyed three quarters of that Roman army, over 30,000 Romans killed in one battle. The following year, another disaster for Rome and a great victory for Carthage. At the Battle of Lake Tresemene, Hannibal, faced again outnumbered uh, by an army of 30,000 Romans, manages to, once again, outwit and outmaneuver this army, uh, annihilating half of the 30,000 soldiers, 15,000 Romans killed at the Battle of Lake Tresemene. But Hannibal's greatest achievement, his greatest victory, and the one that really sets him apart as one of the greatest military commanders of all time, was his victory at the Battle of Cannae, here in 216 BC. The Romans, tired of getting their rear ends handed to them by Hannibal, decided to completely overwhelm him with numbers, and so they raised an army greater than any army they had ever raised before. The numbers range anywhere between 80 and 90,000 for this massive Roman army. Hannibal is outnumbered practically two to one. But again, he completely outwits and outmaneuvers the Roman generals using his now famous double envelopment maneuvers to completely surround this massive army and utterly annihilate it. I won't go into total detail now. We can talk more about that in class. But just know that at the end of one day of fighting, out of an army of nearly 90,000 Romans, 70,000 of them are killed. 
Think about that. Imagine that picture in your head. Picture uh, uh, the Edward Jones Dome where the Rams play football, and now imagine it filled with dead bodies, because that's how many Romans were slaughtered at the Battle of Cannae. This earns Hannibal the uh, the well-deserved moniker of Hannibal the Annihilator. This 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 defeat by the uh, for the Romans is, is so complete that among the dead at Cannae are both consuls for the year 216 BC and 80 senators. Imagine that now. Picture if somehow in battle in the United States we lost both the president, the vice president, and half of Congress. That's how crushing of a defeat this was for the Romans. Hannibal is now free to roam Italy and attack the city of Rome itself. And Hannibal has now become such a specter of fear, uh, of terror, that the mere mention of his name strikes fear in the hearts of all Romans. They had a saying in Rome that really gives you the idea of just how terrifying Hannibal truly was. Uh, They would say, Hannibal ad porto which means Hannibal is at the gates. And uh, that would be something that you'd say if there was something imminently bad about to happen. And so he's sort of like the boogeyman. All things that went bump in the night scared you because you thought that it could be Hannibal. But despite the heavy losses they'd taken at the hands of Hannibal, the Romans refused to concede defeat. And this is one of those great qualities that makes Rome successful. Not that they refuse to surrender on the battlefield, because they know when it's time to retreat. Sometimes uh, retreating is the better part of valor. But it's their refusal to accept defeat on the larger scale. So instead of giving in and surrendering to Hannibal, which they very well could have done after Cannae, instead they raise even more legions to continue the fight. However, Nobody wants to step forward to command these legions. And can you blame them? I mean, look what's happened to anybody who's gone against Hannibal up to this point. They've been annihilated, killed, their armies completely destroyed. But it's at this time that a rather unlikely hero steps forward for Rome. A young man by the name of Cornelius Scipio, who himself in his early 20s uh, now volunteers to take command. Not even legally old enough to hold a consulship, Scipio volunteers uh, because he has something of a bone to pick with Hannibal. He's fought in battle against Hannibal before, been part of the Roman armies that were defeated. Uh, He was at the Battle of Cannae, one of the survivors. And by now, both Scipio's father and Scipio's uncle had been killed in battle fighting against Hannibal. So yeah, he's got a bone to pick here. But Scipio's not just any Roman general. Scipio, unlike other Romans, has spent time studying the tactics that Hannibal's used in battle. He has spent time looking at what Hannibal's done that's helped him to win, and what the Romans have done that have led to their defeat. And now he plans to use Hannibal's own tactics against him in battle. And so using the tactics that he learned from studying Hannibal, Scipio goes on the offensive against Carthage in 210 BC. Uh, He moves into Spain and attacks the Carthaginian base of operations, scoring a number of impressive victories against much more seasoned veteran generals, uh, including Hannibal's own brother, Hasdrubal. Now, meanwhile, Hannibal starts to recognize that the uh, the tide of the war is turning against him, and uh, he calls for reinforcements to come into Italy. Those reinforcements would be led by his previously mentioned brother, Hasdrubal. So Hasdrubal, I know say that name a bunch of times, it's a mouthful. Hasdrubal follows the same path that Hannibal had followed years before, crossing the Alps into Italy. But what he doesn't realize is that there's a Roman army there waiting to meet him. The Romans had dispatched troops northward, and there they surprised and met Hasdrubal in battle and defeated the Carthaginian reinforcement army. Even worse, Hasdrubal himself was killed in this battle. And Hannibal was uh, informed of the death of his little brother rather unceremoniously when the Romans quite literally flung Hasdrubal's severed head over the walls and into Hannibal's camp. It was at this point that Hannibal realized that uh, despite his many great victories, this war was not winnable. Back in Spain, Scipio defeated the Carthaginians entirely and forced them to retreat back into Africa. And with the war now squarely in Rome's favor, Scipio makes plans for an audacious invasion of Africa to attack the city of Carthage directly. And so in 204 BC, Scipio commences with his invasion of Africa. Now, fearing the prospect of an attack, the government in Carthage recalls Hannibal back to the city. 
Hannibal is finally forced to leave Italy and return to Carthage, uh, making years of terror for Romans and those throughout Italy finally come to an end. And thus it is that the climactic battle of the Second Punic War would feature a direct face-off between two of ancient history's greatest military commanders, Hannibal of Carthage and Scipio of Rome. And the battle between these two titans would take place on an open plain near the city of Zama, just north of Carthage. And this time around the tables are turned. It's the Romans who are outnumbered and fighting in foreign territory, and it's Hannibal who has the larger force and is fighting on his own home turf. And again, the tables being turned, uh, it is Scipio whose army defeats Hannibal. And in a, in a twist of irony, Scipio uses Hannibal's own maneuver, the double envelopment, the one that he used to annihilate the Roman army at Cannae, in order to defeat Hannibal at Zama. Hannibal's entire army is nearly completely destroyed. Hannibal himself flees from the battlefield for his own survival, and victory belongs to Scipio. Victory belongs to Rome. With their city now open to attack, the Carthaginian government quickly surrenders to Scipio. As part of the surrender terms, Carthage is forced to give up all of their non-African territories to Rome, and most of their army, and most of their navy. Oh, and they had to pay another huge sum of money uh, as a war penalty to Rome. With the defeat of Carthage in the Second Punic War, Rome takes its next great leap towards empire and becomes the dominant power in the Mediterranean region. Well, what have we seen so far here today, guys? We saw Rome take their first steps towards growing into the mighty empire we know that it becomes. Um, we saw the factors that led to Roman to expand their territory uh, and control all the lands of the Italian peninsula. It was their great army. We also met Rome's greatest rival, Carthage, and we saw Rome fight two important wars against the Carthaginians. The First Punic War fought over Sicily, and the Second Punic War, really a war of revenge for Carthage uh, and Hannibal, the great military general. But despite many great victories for Hannibal, he still could not overcome Scipio and the Romans. And by the end, Rome is the ultimate power in the Mediterranean Sea region. Well, remember those essential questions there, ladies and gentlemen, because uh, the next time that we meet, we will discuss each of those essential questions. And as always, until that time, I bid you farewell.